Okay, nobody here yet, but let's go ahead and get started. And we'll start off with cleaning this shit out of the way. <laughs> I'm once again being uh, overwhelmed by paint bottles that have encroached in my working area. So let's go take care of that. And then we will pick up where we left off. But we're going to leave this one out because we're going to need that one soon enough. It's going to be a pretty hard sell to get as many people on here tonight as we did last night, but you never know. People have surprised me pleasantly a lot recently, so I guess some of you are enjoying the, the back and forth camaraderie that we have going on here. So It's a painting show, but we don't always talk about painting. All right. adjust this a little bouncy and uh, we finished the guy we were working on this morning this uh, this is in the wrong place this is the guy that we were working on this morning the cavalryman this the second cavalryman so now we've got two. We've got these two guys. So now we'll move on to the third on the stand. He's going to have the same shield. We're going to paint him as units. I don't know if that's accurate, but that's just my uh, interpretation. All these guys are all going to have the same shields. By decree. By order of the emperor. over here and let's take a look at this figure this is an armored horse or a half armored horse and it looks like scale armor to me it really does it really does look like scale armor so that's what we're going to paint it as Let's get these spots that are um, that are black first. Make sure we don't miss them. We'll have to come back to them later. And uh, yeah, we'll get started. What is it? Eight o'clock at night. Certainly, we can paint for a couple hours tonight. I would think. Certainly, we'd be able to do that sort of thing. second. 
All right, we're back. Hey, somebody's here. Welcome, welcome. Welcome back. I'm going to guess it's somebody that's frequently comes by, not a new person. It could be a new person. Just going to touch up some black stuff on this guy, and this will be the third cavalry, and we'll get rolling on him. We're going to do the... Um, Actually, going to do the horse color first, then we'll do the armor. And uh, the armor is going to look kind of brownish. Um, this is scale, and scale can come all kinds of different colors, but I feel like this needs to be browns. Br browns? Yes, that's bronze and brown. Browns. Don't mind me, I'm just over here inventing new words for a language that I haven't named yet. <laughs> Esperanto. All right. Let's paint the horse color. We said this guy was going to be kind of a grayish horse. And the reason I'm doing that is that it stands out from the, um, the horse. Now, we are going to put around the, um, I almost ought to do that first because I am I have a really good idea of what color I want to do that. Let's, well, that's really doing it in the wrong ass order. Well, it's a weekend. No rules, just right. Um, let's go ahead and do that because I'm not going to make that bronze I'm not going to make the um, the armor there's like an armored almost like a thing around his head so we're going to make that metal metallic colored So I don't know if I've mentioned this yet. For those of you that are addicts or enjoy watching our game videos, there are not going to be any game videos this coming week. I am playing Daddy Duty all week. And um, so Monday I will not be making it to game night. So it's actually not a big deal. If I'm going to miss some days of not going over there, let's miss some days that are going to be hot as shit. So, no big whoop, we'll paint instead. All right, we got that. And since we got this color here, let's go ahead and do the chain mail on him as well. His helmet's going to be the same color. Let's try to be efficient. Knock all this shit out. That's the same color. There's a lot of constants that I'm not going to change my mind no matter what happens. So let's go ahead and just paint him the color that we know that we're going to paint him. And just get on with it. Paint the metal boss last. I'm not going to do that towards the beginning of the process. Okay, and we have, still have some bronze that's alive here. Let's go ahead and put these little protectors for the eyes on the horse in bronze. Okay. Now 
Now, let's get our SS Camel Black. And we're going to paint the armored scale sections in that. It's the first color that we're going to use. And a little drawing on here it looks like a half armored Byzantine horse. And it definitely looks like it's chainmail or something. But that's not what this miniature represents. Let's blow this up, see. Yeah, it definitely that's definitely chainmail. But that's not what this figure looks like. So I can't really paint it chainmail when it isn't. It looks like it's got little scales on it. Let's get some uh SS Camel Black and go to town on this. paint all this it's just the front half armor to the horse uh, who do we have here Ben welcome back Ben Wadi. This is the third cavalryman. For this army. Okay. Then I probably shouldn't be using this for any kind of dry brushing. Let's use something a little Something that doesn't behave as well. Could I boost my audio a bit? I'm a tad quiet. All right, let's see what I can do. It's boosted pretty high here, but that's as much as I can boost it. I'm trying to be a little quiet for the be benefit of the people here and the and the other people in the house, but. Um, yeah, some of this, uh, we need a little bit drier than that. This is a little too wet. So you can also move the microphone up. I talk loud as shit though. So maybe it was the, something happened, uh, at the, I want to say it was yesterday. It might've been this morning. I kind of lose, lose track, but it's all kind of a blur. And, um, yeah, the, the, the decibel thing wasn't turned all the way up. I think I was just whispering. Okay, is it too loud now? Let me know if it's too loud. All right, so let's just do some wet dry brushing over this. In this brown color. Much better, okay. Don't make me raise my voice. <laughs> I was never one of those people that if I had to talk in front of classes, I was like, um, I, I, I'm kind of embarrassed and I'm gonna talk really low so that way uh, I won't be as embarrassing, you know. I wasn't one of those people. I'm like, I don't need a microphone. It's easy to talk in front of people if you know what you're talking about. If you don't know what you're talking about, you're up a creek, though. But, all right, let me, let's do a test here by adding some white to this and see if it turns kind of grayish. It does, and I'm probably okay with that. So let's, um, let's highlight with some of this here. It just doesn't look like it would be metallic colored by what it is. I 
And again, this is one of these things that I just kind of have to go with experience of how it's possibly going to look after it's been sealed because it is kind of a totally different animal when that happens. There's been many times where I'm like, well, I can't make this look any better. I'm just going to just stick with it. I'm not going to be happy with it. And then I wake up and then I spray it and it's like, what the hell happened? It looks wonderful. So... That's what we're gonna. That's what we're gonna go with for that. Let's paint the rest of the horse, and um, we're gonna use a gray, gray-like horse. A gray-like horse. Let's start off with. Um, I'll use this as a base. The camera's reversed. Why is the camera reversed? Is it because I tinkered with it? Because I did that thing and showed everybody my paints. Let's see. Yeah, it's reverse. God damn it. Oh, well. There we go. Whew. Yeah, I don't want people thinking I'm left-handed. I don't know if I could live with myself. Ben, end to save the day. I guess if I was really worried that people would think that I wasn't human or something like that, I would be worried about. Uh... Yeah, you haven't had to say it in months because I use a different app to connect. Um, the last time I was connecting through um, um, a different app. I'm, I'm using a different one now. I'm using... Uh, Streamlabs, and before I was using something else. And, you know, like on my normal videos, I don't ever have to reverse them. So that's why I had so much of a trouble before. And I think this got reversed because I messed with it. I, was it last night or something like that when somebody's asking me what the what color paints I needed to use, and I turned the camera around and reversed it. And I guess it defaulted to staying that way, of course. So... Oh, well. You caught it before everybody noticed, Ben. The first one here. <laughs> oh, we need to go darker than that. There we go. All right. Let's paint these lower regions here. I had something happen the other day where they... Oh, I know what it was. The last video I uploaded, YouTube put a, pulled a freaking fast one on me and went ahead and uploaded the video and posted it. Because normally what happens is, is I, over, I, I upload it overnight and I go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning, it's, it's finished processing, even in high definition. But, you know, I haven't added like the details of the video and all that kind of shit. You know, I don't do that until the very end. And uh, it went ahead and posted the video without all that stuff added on it um, on my channel. And um, luckily nobody commented on it because it would have just pissed me off. But I didn't do anything different. And all of a sudden, uh, YouTube decided to behave differently. So I'll need to be mindful. Maybe I won't be able to up upload overnight, which is going to really suck because that's just dead time. Because even after you upload a video, you're, um, it's going to take some time to um, process in high definition. And I really don't want people to see the video before it's processed in high definition because, honestly, it just looks like crap. 
So, um, anyhow, I'm gonna have to keep an eye on that shit because that was. I was not happy when I woke up the next morning and and realized the video had already been posted without all the information, without a title of it, everything. So. Drinking coffee and yawning, that's my two super, that's one of my superpowers. Two viewers, Ven and somebody lurking. Hmm. The lurker. <laughs> hey, that's cool. That's how you want to be. I won't see anything either. <laughs> Snap. Hey, it looked like it was going to be a rain day, but it never rained today. It rained enough last night, though, so hopefully it'll stay dry. We'll do some lawn mowing in the morning. And I might actually change my mind on saying I wasn't going to finish these guys until they were all done. I may just do three stands, three figures in one stand at a time. Just so I got kind of a frame of reference of what these guys are starting to look like. Okay. Of course, we need some new white. And my intent is uh, my intent is to uh, play, you know, paint for a couple hours. We'll see if that comes to fruition or not. But got a little under a month to get this figure completed and fifteen more cavalry figures and the command post. And I really want to do the command post, but I got to earn it. Well, I'm going to leave it up for what one for last. I'm leaving that one for last, so. <sighs> a 
we'll still be back on in the morning early Come back and tinker with that a little bit. But right now, that's that's okay. Kind of a starter there. One of two hundred. What the hell is that? Oh, it's characters. You could type up the two hundred characters in a response. That's what it is. Hold on one second, I'll be right back.
Okay. Okay, so what's next? Let's do his uh, leather bits. I'm not sure if that's leather brown or not. I'm not too worried about it. I'll put another spot of leather brown. Well, I guess it's going to be a slow night. Well, you know, last night was extremely busy, honestly, for a Friday night, so... I'm sure I'm I'm the last resort. <laughs> Can we have a fun night out in the town? No. All right. Well, let's. I guess we'll watch Tony. <laughs> or you know, listen to Tony while we're doing something else. So <laughs> I'll take what I can get. And that is unusual because if there's one night I'd be not likely to not paint, it would be Friday night. I'm exhausted from all the, from the week. I do want to finish this guy because I really want to paint another shield. I had a blast painting the, the one this morning. So I'm looking forward to painting the next three guys because I could pick a different shield on them and just see how my interpretation works of it.
So I really didn't get a chance to listen to any of my book today, which is a shame. I think I'm going to mow a lawn tomorrow and I'll get another couple hours in or whatever, but it's starting to get real juicy. I'm hoping it goes through the, the whole thing, but um, I'm not sure at what point of the diodoki it's going to, diodoki, it's going to stop. It's not a physical copy, so I can't just turn through there and realize, you know, when, how far it goes. But it might be available on, um, if I look for it on Amazon, it's definitely an actual book. And I can see the chapters and see how far it goes. Because, man, it's getting, re it's getting really good. It's getting really good. It just, this book has a lot of really good details. So, and a lot of guesswork. A lot of this stuff has just been lost or never was written down or anything like that. But... Definitely some food for thought on some of these scenarios. And like one of the scenarios I can't even do because it's basically like the first battle that happens in the book um, after Alexander's death is um, the Lamian War. And that's where the Athens and stands up and basically goes on revolt against uh, Macedonia, kind of seizing on the opportunity that, you know, they might get a chance to break free. And they end up basically um, They end up besieging Antipater's army. Antipater comes down to, to Greece to kind of straighten things out. And um, and they basically outnumber him and basically besiege him in this town called Lamia. And um, one of Alexander's bodyguards who was a, was given an army, a guy named Leonidas. Leonidas, Leonidas. Who... People apparently confused with Alexander. Yeah, there was, I think, in the book it referred to him as a taller, better looking Alexander. Well, he started exhibiting some mannerisms. He was doing Alexander type mannerisms, and that, you know, he'd, I, I guess Alexander had something that was wrong with his neck where he would, you know, twist his neck and he was doing all those kind of mannerisms. But he was no Alexander. He showed up um, and um, he went to Greece to uh, lib uh, liberate Antipater. And um, he had plenty of troops, but he didn't have a lot of cavalry. The, uh, the Thessalians switched sides in the Lamian War. They, they, switched and they switched from the Macedonians and ended up backing the Athenians. So the, the um, Leonidas shows up and he's outnumbered in cavalry, like two or three to one. And um, he just throws caution to the wind and um, gets into a cavalry fight and gets pushed back into swampy ground and basically loses his footing and ends up getting killed. So right off the bat, first one of the, I wouldn't even call him the, I wouldn't even call him a diadochi because he never got a kingdom. He never got a chance to be a successor of anything. But he's the first guy down. And I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, oh, what would that battle even represent? You'd have to have some swampy ground and you'd be a knight general with two or three stands of calves that got around him and pushed him into the pushed him into the marsh, right? And the cavalry are not fighting in the marsh and they end up trampling him, so... That might be a little too small of a scenario to do for like a DBA battle, but that's really the first one. Um, that's really the first one that happens. First guy to go down.
killed by former allies of the Macedonians. I don't know if they were former allies, maybe former indentured servants of the Macedonians. All the cavalry in the, uh, they had a fair amount of, Alexander had a fa fair amount of uh, Thessalian cavalry. Thessalian, Thessalian? They had a fair amount of it. Okay, there's all the leather bits on there. This guy, of course, is gonna have white sleeves as well because he's part of the same unit. We wanna paint them all the same. Man, slow night, folks. I'm sorry, folk. <laughs> They can't all be winners. I believe we just mixed them. Black and the white. Maybe if I get a little bored then I will mess up with, we'll mess around with some of my Huns and put a Hun army together. I got the figures for them. Shung Nu. Including one of the Hun armies that actually has four stands of bow, a foot bow. That's pretty cool. I forget which one it is. Saber or something like that? Sabir? That's the one. The Saber Hunnic Army, 515 to 558. Cab General or Light Horse or Solid War Band. <laughs> Six Light Horse Archers, which are all Light Horse. And five Hunnic Warriors that can either be Solid War Band or Solid Bow. Wow, what a weird army. I'm not sure I know who the hell these guys are. This list also covers the possibly unrelated Kyanites and Hephthalites. Okay, so this list is, covers Western Hunnic armies from their emergence from the steppes and contact with the uh, Alans in 374 until the last remnants were absorbed by the Avars. List also covers the possibly unrelated Kyanites and Hephthalites, or White Huns, and the Saber. The Kyanites, from their first intervention in Kushan Bactria in 356 until the destruction by the Sassanids in 468. The Hephthalites, until the western parts amalgamation with remnants of the Huan Huan to form the Avars after 558. 
and the loss of the eastern parts Indian Empire around 570, and the Saber from the arrival in the steppes north of the Caucasus around 515 until they were absorbed into the Volga Bulgar Confederacy in 558. Yeah, so really the that's really the same figures as um, the Shang Nu, which are I think a little earlier. They're like three. I'm sorry, two um, low twos, I believe. Yeah, two thirty eight. Yeah, Shang Nu is a cab general, two cab, two more cav. Eight light horse archers and then a light horse or saloy. Two twenty one. What the hell is two twenty one? They have two twenty one as an ally. Uh, which two twenty one? A. Chung and T Chinese army. Oh, they actually have some foot. Boom. Interesting. I want to say, um, I want to say, Kurosan makes some guys that work for that. A White Hunt Army looks interesting with the elephant with 10 halberdiers on it. Yeah. Those guys were trouble for the, um, for the Sassanids, if I remember correctly. The Sassanids have to keep guys, sending guys over to fight on their frontier. But they're all the same figures, you know? I've got a, a bunch of um, um, Gladiator Games uh, Huns that I picked up from Marty. I bought from Marty. And, um, and I would probably supplement with two packs of... Um, of Hans from uh, Forged in Battle. A Cav one and one of Light Horse. And I think Forged in Battle kind of are kind of small on the small end. And um, so I think that they would fit in nicely with the um, with the with the other troops, so um, we'll take a look at them when I when I get done with this guy here. Unless I'm like falling asleep, I need to wake up a little bit. All right, we've got. Um, let's finish painting his white bits, but yeah. So th that should fit out. That should fit nicely um, because Mitch is going to need an enemy for his Han that he's picking up at Historic Han, so. We'll do battles with um, the Battles of Mulan. <laughs> battles from Mulan. I don't think the Gladiator ones actually have a lot of variety in the figures, but, you know, to be honest with you, that doesn't bug me too much. I mean, I did, what, two or three stands? I guess it was just two stands of the Ottoman Turks, and they were all in the same pose. I'm not Ottoman Turks, the Seljuk Turks, Light Horse, and they were all in the same pose, and it, they turned out just fine. So uh, I'm pretty sure I can blend them in and be happy with the results. But I think that's just going to be a total Hun morph. You know, we can do Shang Nu, we can do um, Attila, we can do. White Huns, we can do Saber, we can do, you know, all kinds of things. So, should be cool. And there are armies that, in my opinion, don't look very interesting. You know, they're kind of boring looking, so to speak. And uh, it's an opportunity to make them look not boring. Which I always like to take as a challenge. And 
there's guarantee, guarantee there's going to be some special rules in those scenarios because light horse just don't don't behave right in um, a standard DBA game, you know. But you know, stuff to play test and shit like that. So, I think we need to go a little bit wider than this. I don't know how the hell I would get 10 halibut ears on a freaking elephant. <laughs> I have no idea. But elephants are always cute to paint. You know, I don't think they're a super powerful weapon. You know, they call they cause all kinds of chaos on the battlefield. They um, they start throwing wild cards into things, and you think the battle's going to go one way, and all it takes is a couple of recoils in the wrong direction, and chaos ensues. I'll be right back. Okay, elephant thing is weird. 
Maybe it was like the Burmese Thai one with platforms on the sides. I'm with you. I think that that's... Um, well, what is the description of it? What is the description that it gives you on that? That's 280, right? Elephants crewed by 10 halberdiers. Doesn't say. Doesn't say. These guys all fight the Sassanids, and Mitch has Sassanids, so that's, that's pretty cool. That's another tie-in there. I don't know what figures you'd use for halberdiers. It's a better description, DBMM Book 2, page 101, all right? We got, we got all those books. This is one. Last one I get is two, which is this one. Page 101. Flights in India were reported by a Chinese traveler. What was the Chinese traveler smoking? Hmm? To have had 700 elephants, each crewed by 10 halberdiers, and with a sword fastened to its trunk. Interesting. Very interesting. I want to say there's a picture somewhere. I've got a, you know, these books aren't that useful anymore. I mean, it's, now there's better stuff out there, but uh, I think maybe at the time there was probably, um, it was probably okay at the time, but now there's just so many other Things that are available. I did not have a book on the Scythians. And I got a book on Attila here somewhere. And the Wherever the hell it is. I want to say there's an elephant in there. There's an elephant. There's a there's a white hunt elephant on something. Uh, yeah, this thing. Um, Chip Chack and Petch eggs. Okay. Oh, this has stuff way after the Huns. This is, a, this is an army I wanted to do, the Toba. The Toba are northern Chinese. See, these guys over here. 
I really want to do the Toba. Unfortunately, I've played them like seven times, Morph and Figures, and their record is like one in six or some shit like that. I don't know why, because it really has an army list that really appeals to me. And, um... Oh, here's a Shung Nu Warrior. Oh. Yeah, it might be one of the other books. But anyways, I was I always wanted to build one of those Toba armies. Northern dynasties, but man, I just suck with them. So I don't want to build an army. I haven't played a game with them and I'm already like one and eight with them. <laughs> that's just you know that's just sad. That's just sad. I don't need another Ottoman Turk army that can't win shit, you know? Um God, there's gotta be stuff on the uh, on them. Oh, well, I'm getting sidetracked. I don't care. I don't want to fall asleep. Um, Hef. Hef the light. Elephant. Go back through the kingdom. All right, what about white hunt elephants? White hunt. I'm a big fan of building armies that don't look anything like other armies I have. That would really fit the bill nicely. Oh, that's just damn near useless. Gonna have to use some uh, artistic license that yeah oh well let's take a look at some figures because I'm I'm kind of losing I'm losing steam but you know I have been up since 5 a.m. So. I was mainly wanted to go online here to get out of my wife's way she's packing for her trip and I don't need to be distracted her Let's take a look at some Huns and pull them away from the rest of my troops that the, they're in the bag with. All right. These all should be in a box. It's made of wood. There's all my gladiator stuff. He got these in California before he ever moved from California. I don't know why he had all these figures because he doesn't paint. Going off the status, the White Huns might have had two or even three riders on each horse. Hmm. Alright, what do we got here? Heavy cavalry, but this is for goths and stuff. There's goth and all that stuff. Okay. Hun light archers. Lombard archers. Nope. Hun medium cavalry. Right. Extra heavy cavalry command, but that's for the goths. Frankish infantry. That's an army I want to do. The Franks. Um, they're all, um, Franks have those stupid striped shirts, and I'm like, 
I, that's, that's a challenge to make them pull that off and look correct. Light archers. Goth extra heavy cavalry. Hun medium cavalry. It's two of them. This is Goth medium cavalry. Goth medium infantry. Cavalry command. Human. Light cavalry. I didn't know how to another. I didn't know how to have another pack of them. Lombard nobles. Okay, Hun light spearmen. These are guys I'd use for warband. There's four warband stands. And the cavalry. Hun light spearmen. I think there's ten to a pack. So right here, this is five stands of four. I don't need four of them. So, and Marty bought all these extra guys, but it seemed like he bought like the right amount that he needed. I don't have a whole bunch of extras, which is kind of surprising. Gothic archers, okay. Hun heavy cavalry. Hun cavalry command. And this is light cavalry, but this is goths. Okay. And I also had some kind of an army. This is goth. Uh, Hun figure. So this is all the Huns from here. So that really kind of puts a dent on all of this stuff. So we're going to pull these guys from this box, and they're no longer going to live with there with them. So we got two, we got two packs of ten light archers. So that is five stands of solid bow, and I need four of them. So there's, that's the sabers for those guys, and here's the war band. Yeah, perfect. Hun heavy cavalry. I have all of these. I have some of these troops in, in this big mesh, big morph of this stuff which these guys all this I think there's a little bit of everything in here additional let's take a look at what we got in here just to kind of wrap my head around what it is that we have okay this guy's got a bow this guy's got a javelin I like these one-piece castings. I don't have to fiddle with putting a certain guy on a certain horse. Here's another bow guy. Another bow guy. Another guy in this pose. This guy's an Alon figure. He's got like one of those Alon caps. We'll move him off to the side there. There's a javelin guy. Another one of those, those. These are like goth infantry. Goth archers. Goth infantry. Another Alon. These are all the same pose. Nope. Nope. This one's slightly different, isn't it? This one's slightly different. Yeah, see, I don't have a whole lot of variety. Now, this would probably work, but... Okay, 
that's this one here. This one here. This one here. Okay, here's, I guess, the commander. He's got a tight like a butter knife. Uh, he's cool, but doesn't exactly instill fear. Here's a standard bearer. Okay, these are all gothy guys. I guess this is one of the heavy cavalry dudes. These guys are goths. They must have had some goth allies in here as well. Which I got other got all goth guys to go with them. And I guess this one goes with this one. So that's what I have. All right, let's get another couple bags. Let's straighten this. Let's straighten this shit out and see what I got to deal with here. That's to the troop stove. <laughs> Something that's like scissors. Well, I got an exacto knife. That should work fine. All right. So I'm gonna take all these gothy guys, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. We're just not messing with that right now. Let's take all these gothy guys and the uh, and the Alans and put them all. Take them out of the equation. Just take them completely out of the equation. I'm gonna put them down here because they're gonna go in that. They're gonna go in that wooden box like the other ones. Now let's take these unopened packs. Okay, and here we got Hun Medium Cavalry. I don't think I have any of these figures there. It might be this figure right here. So I'm going to pull them out of the packaging. I'm going to save this. And I'm going to put these guys in a bag. together with the label and these guys don't even have looks like they're supposed to have a lance and they don't have a lance on there so or a javelin or something like that okay those are all the same pose the big guy I would use on one of the cavalry stands oh the bags don't don't want to lock up cheap ass Chinese bag no doubt all right, what do we got here? Hun Medium Cavalry. Oh, isn't that what I just had? 1403. I got another bag of them. All the same pose. So these are five, so I've got 10 of them. So that's enough for three stands. Yeah. We're definitely going to be getting a, a pack of of, um, of medium cavalry from um, Forged in Battle to mix in. Alright. I didn't think I had two packs of them, but what's this? Light infantry spearmen, we don't have to pull them out. I don't have any extras. Hunt Heavy Cavalry, okay. Spearman, Spearman, should be Bobo. Yep, all right, 
We don't need to pull these out of the package. And here's the command. Let's look and see what that is in the heavy. It's almost like I don't have any. These guys are guys that will go on the cab stand as well. Damn, they don't look like the same freaking figure. Oh, they're slightly different. All right. So we're going to save this sticker. And just by doing this exercise, I have kind of laid hands on all this stuff. And now I've got a pretty good idea of what I have or don't have. Let's drop these five in here. It's the tiniest of bags. Not even space for one good snort of Coke. <laughs> like I would know. got a cavalry command. Let's see who's in there. Let's keep this. We got like a medium cavalry guy, another medium cavalry guy, another guy with a butter knife, and a couple guys here with all right, so we'll put, let's just put these in the, Cavalry Command. And it's funny, these are older, I mean, he must have bought these almost 20 years ago when he was in California, and they were already the, the hard alloy. You could tell they were heavy on the pewter. They are heavy on the tin. They're not very soft. Not the light horse goes in here. So yeah, like I said, I'm buy one pack of light horse, a pack of, ca pack of cavalry, and maybe a pack of command. Man, it should be all set. Just for variety. You got to make these guys look interesting or, you know. So now I've gone through them. And I got a, I got a good idea of what it is that I have. Tony at night. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now we're up to four people. Good. See, do I have a fat exacto knife? I don't. So I'm going to put on here. Huns. Honey, I'm home. Yep. Hold on one second. They're certainly fun. Crazy shit happens with them. All right. So if 
I see any of those figures at the store, I'll pick them up. If not, if we decide to go in that direction when I get back, I know what I gotta order. So. Damn it! I knew you should have checked down. Yeah. I was uh, falling asleep. Ben was keeping me company here. All right. Let's get back on it. I knew I bullshitted enough to wake the hell up. Yeah, I got two cavalry figures done, and this here's the third one, so. <laughs> Anyhow, it'll allow us to experiment with some rules for some scenarios. And, um, yeah, maybe you guys will enjoy them. Maybe you won't. Over the time comes around for doing that, so. All right, let's get that dark red out here, which is right over here. Six viewers. All right, looks like you brought everybody in. Nordic, you were having a block party. Nordic the Piper. You had to bring them all in, playing your flute. A lute and a flute. There's lots of instruments like that. Um, bagpipes, banjos, flutes, fiddles. They're okay sometimes, and sometimes you just want to break the you just want to break the instrument over the freaking person's head because they're so damn annoying. And you're painting the Persian general now. All right, well, we're gonna have a smackdown with the Ottomans. You checked the eight. YouTube didn't show you were live streaming. Damn YouTube. Yeah, you should be subscribed. Uh, eight? I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, it had to be at eight. It was like a, almost like 7.30. You're the heart of the party. There you go. Yeah, I just need some interaction. To, I suppose you're casting me in the role of the Pied Piper, eh? Yep. We got a fun outfit for you to wear too. <laughs> I don't know. Some of those medieval outfits, I'm like, man, what? What would that guy do to you that he's got to wear that? You know? <laughs> Good lord. It was always fumbles. Always fumbles. I'm not bending over on the weekend. We've <laughs> got a whole week to bend over. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. He's the one that wears kinky outfits. Yeah, I don't want to see none of that stuff. No, thank you. Now, if you're going to be the Pied Piper, you got to wear a weird outfit. Kind of like a court jester, you know? You got to be wearing tights if you're a court jester, one of them jackass hats. Someone say kinky. There you go. Do do whatever you want in the privacy of your home, but please show some privacy. <laughs> please show some privacy. We're going to be painting all next week. Maybe not a huge amount each day, but I'm going to try to at least paint an hour each day, so... Try to get these guys done. I'm never gonna get around to painting my World War II stuff. I'm just, I just know it. I just never am. 
You know, I got too much stuff I want to do with this. I need to see Nordic in the Jester outfit. I don't need to see anybody in a Jester outfit. You better be paying me first. Everything has a cost, right? No touching either. That's extra. <laughs> no touchy touchy. I think we need to perform some surgery on this thing. This is well past its prime. It'll last a little longer until I have to do surgery again. Is this a choose your own adventure? Do you guys see that choose your own adventure show on um, Netflix that came out a couple of years ago? What was it called? Bandersnatch? Which of course sounds like a Really bad porno, Bandersnatch. But uh, I don't remember much about it other than I think three or four times during it you could decide, you know, what what a character does. I don't remember what the choices were. It might have just been, you know, do this or this. But um, alternative endings. I remember seeing it and. Don't remember Jack about it, which is typical. I remember stuff that I read a lot more than stuff that I watch on television. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Bandersnatch. I remember it being a little creepy too, saying it, but that's about it. Yes, it's a choose your own adventure, ha. Huh? Go to the fork in the road. What do you do? Um, pick the fork up and eat some macaroni with it. I don't know. I go in whichever direction has the more pleasant smell. I would imagine they smell the same. Which one has less road apples? <laughs> Which path is least strewn with road apples? Stink, stink, stunk. Your path leads to funk. All right. We've got some little tufts here and underneath the horse. I almost feel like I need to be red just to kind of go with the whole red theme. And I think I am going to do that. I think we're going to... I believe we use scarlet for all those. So let's just scarlet them all up. flat red What are you doing these days, Rick? Are you playing, um, you grinding Skyrim while you're listening? And, um, 
I, it never occurred to me to do two, those two things. But last weekend, uh, everybody was watching a show, and I'm like, ah, I'm not really interested in this show, but I'll watch it. But I'll grind playing Diablo. So I was playing Diablo grinding. I didn't need volume for that. And, um, you know. They may have to go with 6mm forward to Pacific, giving limited gaming space that will get a lot of stuff on the board. Well, I'm off. I just popped off to add some thumbnails, some uploading videos. Now it's time for some games. Okay. Good luck with that. Did you guys see, um, well, you guys wouldn't have done it. You guys aren't DBA guys, but, um, the guy was on here yesterday and I don't remember what his name is cause he has a complicated name, but he was on here quite a bit and, uh, he came up with this idea, which is really novel. I don't, it's, it sounds good on paper and, um, I got to try it next time. It's just Mitch and I, we got to try this stuff out. I'll tell you what his name is. It's Hoffman. Hoffman Sama. And uh, he came up with these alternative rules for DBA to use a, um, a set of Jenga while you're playing it. And um, so you, you have a, basically a game of DBA and the Jenga. And the Jenga tower basically represents um, an art alternative... Um, well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll read his exact writings from Fanaticus for put on there. You really like studying morale on the battlefield? Sometimes tabletop war games don't represent morale that great. Or if they do, it can really bog down a battle and make rules more complicated. So here's my attempt at DBA morale, rules light system, that keeps the spirit of DBA and keeps the game fun and fast. The only rule I changed in DBA is that four elements does not equal defeat. A player loses the game by toppling the Jenga slash block tower or having all their elements destroyed. So if you lose all your elements, it's, you obviously lose. But um, you don't actually break. Your army doesn't break and lose the game until the tower, until the Jenga tower falls down. Um, and I hope he comes on here because I actually have a question about him because I haven't played it yet, but there's one question that automatically jumps to mind, but I'll let him answer that. And, um, but on Facebook value, it looks really, really interesting. So, um, I gotta try that with Mitch. That, that sounds like, um, uh, like cool. That looks pretty cool, but he's got, he's got the shakes more than I do. So, you know, I should have an advantage there. Basically, every time you like lose a unit, you got to pull two, you got to pull two blocks. You know, and you place them at the top. If the unit recoils, you pull one. I could see it be pretty interesting. I could definitely see it being pretty interesting. Tony has questions. I always have questions. Yeah, my question is, is uh, what's to keep from somebody picking the block all the way at the bottom? Like weakening the bottom first. I guess if you're really confident that you're going to win the game, you pull from the bottom. I don't know. It's, it's certainly worth trying out. So now you have a battle where you're playing blind. A blind general Jenga Tower one. I mean, you, you know, Wow. I mean, I like the idea of not knowing when your army is going to break. I mean, I really like that. Um, but we'll see. We have to play on something that's pretty sturdy. And I just don't think that putting it on the table next to what we're playing is going to work. It's pretty unsturdy. But I got to say, Jenga, 
That's a pretty novel idea, I have to say. Definitely worth playtesting. You come up with something that novel, I'm going to take a look at it. And like I said, it sounds good on paper. It may actually not work in practice, but um, it's definitely intriguing enough to give it a shake. I thought about doing a battle where both sides start forces randomized and troops come in on the field as reinforcements a couple elements at a time. Um, I haven't because the idea of just making your own random force just seems kind of pointless. You know. No, so almost kind of like a collision course. You're talking about like one of our collision course battles, but you don't even know who's going to show up to fight. Um... Oh. oh, man, I need to wake the hell up or go to sleep. Kevin, welcome back. Special K. <laughs> have you been working on, have you been working all day on a new joke for us? Want to go down the rabbit hole and talk World War II tonight? <laughs> so you say you want to do the Pacific. What what in Pacific do you want to do? You want to do island hopping? Do you want to do Burma, New Guinea, China, Manchuria? I had to do land if I had to do the Pacific and I had to do land I would do New Guinea without a doubt no more yawning that's a party foul yeah I don't want to yawn but it happens I've been up since five so and I've basically become immune to caffeine seems like Vote down the rabbit hole. What shall the World War II topic be? You ready? Ready for something crazy? No, it's not crazy. I don't want to go to bed. I got to do something to keep myself awake. But we're going to pull a book that my first World War II book ever. Ho ho! What the hell could it be? And don't worry, this is a fun book. And uh, you'll get to see what an antique looks like. I'm going to put this away. We'll pick this back up in the morning. So we're going to talk about this until, until we can't talk about it anymore. I just looked over and I saw this book and I'm like, ah, let's, let's screw with this. So the first World War, World War II book that I got is probably close to 1981. And this is a book that they had at a, you know, they have these these um, these book fairs on um, in school, you know, and you're like, hey, sign up for this book fair, and they give you this catalog of what things to buy, and of course, there's just a bunch of just horse shit that I wasn't really interested in. So, um, you want to do some island amphibious assaults, like, so I'm going to pronounce the name of that. Like, uh, I had a history teacher in seventh grade, Tarawa. He called it Tarawa. Like, that guy really went out of his way to, to call it that. I also want to do some reef fights of Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, the British in Burma and such. Pretty much the good stuff. Okay. So anyways, I had a book fair, and they had this book here called World War II Quiz and Fact Book. And... What does it say? Three dollars and ninety-five cents. Look at the look how yellow this bastard is. Let's see how old this thing is. Berkeley Books, New York. 
I mean, this is. And there's obscure shit in here. 1982. Okay. So, um, this pretty obscure stuff in here. And um, there's like question and answer shit. Actually, is that all there is? How is this thing organized? Let's see, the air war. Multiple choices, I'll tell you what. You guys, let's see, there's gotta be a, um, okay. I'm gonna give you some topics here. You guys pick what, uh, ask quiz questions. Absolutely, that's where we're gonna go. That's where we're gonna go. And I'm gonna skip obvious ones if I encounter ones. Like, you know, if you're a World War II guy, you should know shit like this. You know, you're not gonna, you know, who was in charge of the Luftwaffe and, you know, crap like that. You know, it's like, that's dumb shit, okay? You guys ought to know this. So, um, so here's the categories. Multiple choice, meaning covers all areas of the war on land, sea, and in the air, plus personalities, historic events, politics, and lesser known events. So you got multiple choice, you got code names, messages and quotations, quotes on war in general, the war on land, the air war, naval operations and sea battles, historic dates. Any of that, uh, any of that interest you? If not, I'll just pick one. Which, of course, means we'll just start at the beginning. Which would be multiple choice. D, all of the above. All right, we'll start with multiple choice. And you know what? I can't just do this. I got to try to do some painting on the side because it's not going to fill it up this whole thing. So, Multiple choice, question one. Shit, I can probably keep score. Fuck it, let's do it. <laughs> hey, we're here to have fun, right? We're here to have fun. First correct answer gets it. You don't lose any points for. You get one. You get one answer. You don't lose any points if you get it wrong. This will give me something to do. Question number one. Multiple choice. Identify, actually, you know what? Some of these are multiple choice and they probably shouldn't be. Question one, identify the type of aircraft that was produced in larger numbers than any other during the war. I actually know this one. What aircraft was produced more than any number in the war? But what's what's today's date? 520, 625? Yep. Yeah, this is actually really, this is actually a pretty cool little book. You think, oh, this is a stupid little book. Well, it's, 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 it's pretty cool for what it is. Remember, I got this thing when I was like, you know, 11 years old or something like that. Nordic says Mustang. Let's bring the paints back up. We'll do some painting on the side. I just need to wake the F up. Hey, you don't want me to yawn. This is what we got to do. Messerschmitt 109. Joe's got it. Joe has it. I think it's too easy if you give all the questions. Like, if nobody gets it, then, I'll, then, you know, then we could go into doing it. But the, but the questions were... Japanese Zero, 109, B-24, Liberator, DC-3. I think it's pretty easy. So 30, nearly 36,000 were produced. So. Coton. Coton gets one point. Question number two. Which American entertainer 
traveled the most to entertain troops during the war? No idea at all about World War II. What? Get out of this city. Well, it's the only quiz and fat book I have. Sorry. I don't have medieval times or, you know, who's who in Achaemenid Persia. <laughs> I've never even heard of this guy, so... American entertainers who traveled the most to entertain troops during the war. Nobody's going to know that shit. Bob Hope. Well, that was one of the multiple choices, but that's not the correct one. It's literally a guy I've never heard of. This literally guy I'd never heard of before, which, you know, it's not like I'm all all knowing about entertainers anyways, you know. Nothing? Nah, you guys aren't going to get this. Some guy named Joe E. Brown. Never heard of him. Not Joey Brown, Joe E. Brown. Joe E. Brown traveled over 150,000 miles. He was named father to all men overseas by the National Father's Day Committee in 1944. Okay, easy question coming up. All you guys should know this. Even Dirk should know this question, okay? Even Dirk. Which unit was nicknamed the Red Devils? What unit was named the Red Devils? You guys should all know this. I mean, if you're a World War II guy, you'd know what this is. Joe Brown. <laughs> uh, a little late there. Nobody gets that one. You're still in the lead. What unit is nicknamed the Red Devils? British Airborne. Okay. Which unit? Fourth Airborne Division. Nope. British Paras. Yeah? Which unit? There's only two that I know of. There might have been more. One of them landed at Market Garden, and the other one landed in Normandy. And they're not in sequential they're not in sequential order. Sometimes things don't make sense. Kind of like a Panther D came out before a Panther A. Go figure. These are the guys that landed at Normandy. The 6th, there we go. 6th Airborne Division. Yep, another one for Joe. Okay. 6th Airborne, give you anything else? Nope. Oh, this is an interesting. This is an interesting one. I wouldn't know this. Joe should have an advantage because it's a naval question. Although it may not be something that he's aware of. I would not have known what this is. Identify the only U.S. Navy ship sunk by enemy gunfire on D-Day. The only U.S. Navy ship sunk by enemy gunfire on D-Day. I did not know this. And I would honestly be surprised if anybody knew this because this must be a very small vessel. It's smaller than a destroyer. I would think. I never heard of it, so. I am 
not on tonight. Well, you know, it's the questions. You know, it's they're not. Only U.S. Navy ship sunk by gunfire on D-Day. I don't think any of you guys are going to get it. I wouldn't have gotten it. It's a ship called the Cory. USS Cory. C-O-R-R-Y. Oh, and you can't look shit up on the internet either. Come on. No cheating. All right? You guys are better than that. I'm not saying that you've done it already, but... By gunfire from German gun batteries on Utah Beach, 13 members of her 294-man crew died. USS Corey. It's got to be like an LST or something like that. An LCI, LST. No, wait a second. An LST wouldn't have, wouldn't have a 294-man man crew. It's got to be like a minesweeper or something like that. Okay, identify the first U.S. Army Air Force aircraft type to see action in Europe. Which type of aircraft in the U.S. Army Air Force, so it's not a Navy plane, uh, aircraft was the first one to see action in Europe? I'll even tell you when it was. It was on July 4th, 1942, according to the book. I would not have known this one either. It's not a very common aircraft. It's not an aircraft you think of like, oh yeah, it's a World War II plane. So Dirk's not going to get this one. Sorry, Dirk. It's funny because the plane I would have guessed is actually not one of the choices. I'm not doing the choices. It's just too easy. It's too easy for somebody to just do random guess. We're just here having a freaking conversation anyways. It really doesn't matter who wins. P-40 is exactly what I would have guessed, Joe. Absolutely is the fruit I would have guessed. PBY is an excellent guess, but not correct according to this book. Those two are both excellent guesses. Another good guess would be a wildcat because some wildcats were on uh, British escort carriers. There was a couple of escort carriers that gave that gave them some wildcats. That would also be the wrong answer. The correct answer is the Douglas A-20G Havoc ground attack bomber on July 4th, 1942. I don't know where what it would be doing on July 4th, 1942, but an A-20G, that's just not a plane that you think of. Next question. How did U.S. Admiral Thomas C. Hart, Commander-in-Chief of the Asiatic Fleet, depart from the Philippines on December 26, 1941? How did U.S. Admiral Thomas C. Hart, the Commander-in-Chief of the Asiatic Fleet, depart from the Philippines on October 26, 1941? I, uh, I honestly saw um, 
I watch a history series on like the Philippine stuff, like in 1941. I had no jack shit about that. I'm not big on the Pacific Theater. I'm really not big on the Pacific Theater, like, you know, what happened in the Philippines when they were, like, evacuated and the Japanese took over. I really didn't know shit. So it was actually a really interesting program. Uh, PT Boat, an excellent question. A-20 is a light bomber. Yeah, but nobody thinks about it. Nobody thinks of it. PT Boat, that's an excellent guess, but wrong. That's an excellent guess. I mean, that's probably what I would have guessed as well. Nothing. On a U.S. submarine, the Shark, it headed for Java where the Asiatic fleet was reorganizing. A yacht. No, it's also a good choice. Submarine? I'm not getting in a fucking submarine. A lot of the staff officers were ferry around on them because of lack of other ships. Yeah. Uh, we're going to skip the next question. It's a Hitler question. You know, who's a chef, show, chauffeur? Fuck that. We're not interested in that. World War II question, not a... Who's who in the Nazi party? Skip that one, too. All right. We're going to move to a different area. These are, what is this, multiple course, quote names, one land. All right, let's, let's see here. Let's, let's do something that people know every, something about. Good luck. What do you got here? The war on land. Everybody knows about land war, right? That one's too easy. F it, I'll do it anyways. You guys ready to type quick? Name three American beaches at Normandy on D-Day. Well, that's a trick question. Because there's only two. Nah, dumbass question. Uh, it's too easy a question. All right, here's one I have no idea. Who was the American baseball player who performed espionage for the U.S. while on a visit to Japan as a member of a U.S. baseball team in 1934. Who was the American baseball player who performed espionage for the U.S. while on a visit to Japan as a member of a U.S. baseball team in 1934? Yeah, Kev gets to play the World War II quiz. Good luck on this one. This guy I never heard of. Not that I've heard of it. Not that I'm a baseball guy or a sports guy for the, any question, for any matter. I do any kind of trivia. I'm useless on sports shit. I'm useless on sports and literature. Give me flags and maps and history. Yeah, it was a trick question, Nordic. I didn't realize that when I read it. You know, the original question, name three American beaches on Normandy, and there's like, there are only two. It's this and that. Like, I'm not, these aren't trick. The point is not to do trick questions. Trick questions are like done for people that, you know, they want to, you know, feel superior or whatever. 
baseball player who performed espionage for the U.S. while on a visit to Japan as a member of the U.S. baseball team in 1934. Don't forget gold. Yeah. Well, gold was gold was uh, British, right? No. Yes. Gold, Juno, sword. Juno was the Canadian one. Yeah. Gold, Juno. Because Juno was between the other two. Yeah. Nobody's going to know this baseball player. Morris Moe Berg, who was joined on the trip by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Berg took photographs of restricted areas that were later used by U.S. pilots on bombing missions. He was the only player on the trip with a letter of introduction to the U.S. diplomatic and, and consular offices, officers from Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Let me, um, let me do something here. Oh. That's not what I wanted to do. Cambyses the second. No, I actually know more about Cambyses the second than any baseball player. And I don't know shit about Cambyses the second. Oh, man. Uh, there should be an option here to change. All right. Let's see here. Reset. 360. Okay, that's cool. Customization. Message delay. How long do you want participants to wait between sending messages? I don't. Okay. Um, I don't need a trailer. Can I speed up the answering? Well, I can blacklist words so you guys can't type certain words. Yeah, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> what position did he play? Halfback? <laughs> Halfback. That's right. That's right behind the shortstop. He's halfway back to the backfield. Yeah, I thought there was a I thought there was a, an option here for for that. Maybe it wasn't. Oh well. Censorship is the devil. Yep. Pretty much. What was the first battle in the Pacific with the Japanese defended territory the empire held prior to its conquest in the war? So there was some... This is a battle that the Japanese got attacked on, the, on, on territory that they owned or they were in control of before the war started. Allies brought it to them. Where did that happen? Where was the first place that that happened? Where was the first place the Japanese were on the defensive? Not necessarily the defensive, but, you know, what did they have before the war and they got attacked? Where is that located?
Gregory Promfet, welcome. Can't stand the shift as a baseball pure, purist. I don't know what the hell the shift is. Oh, that's right. Joe knows about baseball. Yeah. Where was the first place the Japanese were? Territory they had before the war started and they got attacked. Where was the first place that that happened? I want to say Bougainville or Robal, but I think I'm wrong. No Mohan. Manchuria, no. No, Manchuria is actually a good choice. Japan on Doolittle Raid, no. No, I guess they didn't consider that a battle. They didn't consider Doolittle Raid a battle, or it would have been before this. Um... No, not necessarily. It may not have been. I'm not sure when this happened. What was the first battle in the Pacific where the Japanese defended territory the Empire held prior to its conquests in the war? So it had to be something that was already Japanese territory when they declared war. So it can't be Guadalcanal. can't be, you know, Sumatra. That was Dutch. And I'm actually not surprised people wouldn't know that. Um, I, obviously, a place I've heard of, but I would not have thought it was the first one. And I'm thinking it was some kind of a freaking air raid, probably. Kwajalein, the largest atoll in the world, measuring 18 miles wide by, by 78 miles long. 18 wide by 78 long. Can't even name a U.S. baseball player. I'm right there with you, Dirk. No clue. Which of the three British beaches at Normandy? I mean, we just talked about it. Gold, Juno, and Sword. Which of the three British beaches at Normandy? Gold, Juno, or Sword was the costliest. Which one was the costliest in, in terms of, well, you know, manpower, material, whatever. Which one did, uh, which one had the most ass beating on it? Let's get um, Hey, it's multiple guests. You get three. This is a difficult book for a freaking 11 year old. Gold Beach. No. Nope. Sorry, Nordic. No points for you. I may have known this one. I may have known this one. Gold Beach is the one that's the closest to um, Omaha. Two. What's next? Oh, the shirt. There's more of this white stuff showing. 
That's that's a long that's a long ass shirt. Maybe a World War II nut, but I'm not ashamed not to know some of these answers. Yeah, they're and I'm skipping over some real obscure shit. Be back in a moment. Moment. Need to use the bathroom. All right. Well, you don't get another guess. Any other guesses on what the most costly beach is? Which of the three British beaches at Normandy was the cost costliest? Costliest. Costliest mess. I don't know if it was the, the easiest of all the beaches. I think was Utah. I'm thinking. Um, Dieppe, wrong. Not one of the choices. Dieppe was 42. That crazy raid with the Churchill Mark Ones. There he is, John Mifkovic. John, you coming to Historicon in a month? And we're gonna is the Canadian contingent coming down to Historicon in a month? Uh, nope, it's not sword. There's only one left. <laughs> There's only one left. There's only one left, and it's the one that your people landed on. <laughs> Nope. No, it was the one that the, it was the one that John's people landed on. No, it's Juno Beach. It's where the Canadians landed on Juno Beach. And as a matter of fact, the Canadians had some nasty ass fighting. Nasty ass fighting against the 12th Hitler Jugend around the airfield outside of Cannes. Just nasty fighting for many, many. There's definitely some bad blood between those two. Well, I mean, it was basically the freaking 12th SS like killed a bunch of Canadians that had surrendered. And, you know, it wasn't like the Canadians were like, oh, let's just hose these guys. It was like, uh, oh, you kill our people, we'll screw you, you know. So, yeah, there's some nasty fighting between uh, between those guys. Let's see what else we got on here. That... Name the first German city captured by U.S. troops. First German city captured by U.S. troops. It's probably in. Did it say when? No. No, I bet it was in 45. That could be wrong. Either got sunburn on my knees or my knee joints are inflamed. Ak and Joe gets it. You would have liked to come this year, but I've got another fight going on here at home. Uh, you having a war game convention on the same weekend or a different kind of fight? <laughs> I hope it's another war game convention. But I have a feeling it's actually the other thing, so... Uh, 
this is an interesting one. Identify the only amphibious invasion thrown back with a loss. The only amphibious invasion thrown back with a loss. These guys went to invade something and didn't succeed, got repulsed. Makes it sound like amphibious invasions are easy. Well, every, amphibious invasions always work when we try them, except this one time. They must have not had overwhelming odds or something. I'm actually surprised that... Um, and it's not Dieppe. I don't know why. I'm going to give you guys a clue. It's not Dieppe. I don't know why it's not Dieppe. Because as far as I know, they went in there and they got the they sent the Canadians, they got their ass kicked because it was like a testing thing. I don't know all the details, but it was kind of a precursor to test the defenses and didn't go so hot. Didn't go so hot. Aleutian Islands, that's a hell of a good guess. That's a hell of a good guess, and probably what I would have guessed. Dieppe raid. No, it's not that one. No, you get to guess again. I don't know if you caught it in time by the time I said it, but... I probably would have guessed the Dieppe raid, and for whatever reason, it's just... I guess it's a raid. I don't know. They expected to lose. I don't know what the parameters... Are. Whoever wrote this decided not to be that one, so... More specifically, Dutch Harbor. Well, according to this book, it's not that one. I don't know how much of a delay is on here, but we'll give it another minute for you guys to answer while we continue painting. The whites of their shirts. I would have guessed the Dieppe raid. Bay of Pigs, wrong war. According to this, the Japanese attempt to take Wake Island. On December 11th, 1942, a few days later, they tried again and succeeded. Well, that's kind of hokey. So round one of trying to take Wake Island. I don't know, did you answer before me? Well, you typed it, so it'd be pretty stupid for you to type it after I said it. So I'm going to give you the point. As long as you're not using the internet. never going to get this question. I'm just going to skip stuff like this. You know, I'm going to actually read this question to you and tell you this is the kind of question that nobody would get. Am I using the same shield pattern for this dude? I am. Exactly the same. So here's the kind of question. This is a cool question, but nobody was going to get this question. Identify the highest ranking trader in the war. Well, everybody's going to say Quisling, right? But that's not what it is according to this. Identify the highest ranking trader in the war. General Andrei Andreevich Vlasov, a hero during the attack on Moscow, was captured by the Germans and cast his lot with them. He built up an army of Soviet prisoners who fought for Germany until May 1945. Captured by Patton, turned over to the Russians. He was hanged. You typed it way before you said it. Yeah, I'm giving it to you. I don't know what the delay is on here, but it's apparently stupid. It's a pretty stupid delay. So it's questions like that that are like, 
And I think there's a way to adjust it, what the delay time is, but maybe I can't do it if get prime dashboard. Oh, bot. I'm not done here. Settings is that on settings? Oh boy. General. Nope. Output. Nope. Audio. Nope. Video. Nope. It's advanced. Uh, nope. Notification appearance, remote control, virtual game overlay, good support. No, nope, I don't see it on here. I think there's a way. I may have to start it in a different a different way. I don't see where that is an option to change it once it is rolling. No, well, as you say in Canada, sorry about that. don't think I can change it here either. Yeah, I don't see where I can change it here. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, this one's way delayed. Okay. All right, next question. Here's a question, and this one's worth four points. What are the four things that Eisenhower said won the war for the Allies? Four things that won the war for the Allies. One point for each. Ike said, Ike said the war was won by the Allies for four, four things contributed to it. What were the four things that won? Studio, welcome. The Wolfman, I love your last video. I love the background music. By the way, I'm inspiring me. You're inspiring me to paint Byzantines. I always wanted to do Iglabids in Sicily with a Byzantine ally. There you go. Byzantines. Damn it, I'm motivating people. What the hell's wrong with me? Hitler. That's a good choice, but no. <laughs> One of the four things. Four things that none of them are a, or a person. None of them are a person. The four things Eisenhower said won the war for the Allies. Hitler. Hitler won the war. Well, Hitler made them lose the war. But Hitler also caused there to be a war, but... Logistic numbers, determination, and cooperation, none of the above. They're actual things. They're actual things. U.S. war production. Nope. Not according to this. Although, obviously, yes, that's one of them. <laughs> if you ask me, absolutely. I'm the most active DBA channel. Well, that doesn't mean shit. Nobody else puts out any stuff. <laughs> I mean, you're number two. 
You're number two studio. Nobody else puts out stuff like that. <laughs> oh. I just don't want this silly ass game to die, that's all, while I'm painting figures for it. You know, it's self serving in that respect. I mean, why would I want to work on a game that nobody plays? Nobody plays the game because nobody can figure out how to play it or get through the rules. So it's kind of for my own reason. But that's the reason. Bullets, no. Better soldiers, no. Better generals, no. More supplies, no. Lead and lease program, no. Sherman tank, good answer, no. Allied air power, no. Even though Allied air power and U.S. war production are definitely some of the top two. There's no doubt about it. All right, I'm going to give one of them away. And you can't use it anymore. Okay, you can't score any points for this one. The A-bomb. The A-bomb is one of the ones that he said. Might just too be, be too difficult of a question. I may not have gotten any of them. And I'm not sure that I agree with his four choices. Abom is definitely the one that had the most effect. Certainly it didn't affect anything in Europe. But. I'll give you guys a few minutes and then I'll just give you what the answers are because it's not so good a question, I guess. Greg Keller, back from town. Welcome to the World War II quiz. You're not that far behind if you start now. Like your Mons Grappius games. Couldn't deploy the legions fascinating. I love those games. I love the scenarios. The Jeep. Yes. Give Dirk a question. A, a point. Yes. Dirk gets one for the Jeep. Yes. The Jeep, the A-bomb. What are the other two things? I'm going to give you a clue. One of the other ones is a weapon, and the other one is a vehicle. Bazooka, there you go. Not looking these up, are you, Dirk? <laughs> is New Zealand known for cheaters? <laughs> B-17, that's a good question. Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One vehicle left. V2. Whoops, wrong side. Yep, no. No, it was not a victory weapon. A victory weapon. M1 Grand. Excellent, excellent guess, but not according to this book. Imagine if the M1 Grand had like a 20 round magazine and not that 8 round clip man that would that would have been just phenomenal condom no no what battle what battle are you fighting pinup girls no no it definitely helped but uh no not exactly a vehicle what vehicle are you riding in the battle i'm riding pinup girls <laughs> no and i would have said sherman tank you know but no, it's not what I think. It's what, according to this book from 1982, decided to think that that's what the thing was. M3 half-track. P51. No. No, all good guesses. I don't know that you'll ever get it. Because I would not have gotten it, and I don't agree with it. DC-3. The DC-3 or the C-47 is... You blokes across the pond like to call them Dakotas. Which, all right, for you Brits, which British ground commander held the distinction of never having lost a battle? Which British ground commander held the distinction of never having lost a battle? 
according to this book. There, I'm covered. My middle figure to the author. <laughs> I don't agree with DC3. I don't agree. You know, here's a fact. Here's a World War II fact that I've known my whole life. It may not be accurate, but at least I grew up n knowing this, is that the Germans produced more vehicles in like 1944, I think, than all other years combined. You know? Um, when they were getting this living ship bombed out of each other. Um, no, Wellington was not. Wrong war, dude. Harold Alexander. No. Not Harold Alexander. I actually would have guessed that it was that slim guy. And it was that guy who was out in Burma. Everybody seems to think that he was a really... I don't really know anything about him. I just know that that guy is known as one of the best Allied commanders. Is that slim guy that was a... He was a British general. I think he was a British general. He was out there in Burma and basically held the Japanese at bay. And even went on the offense or whatever. But uh, it's not him. It's not him, according to this book. Wingate. No. I can't believe you guys don't know this one. You guys should know all of your Commonwealth... All your British, uh, all your British commanders from the Second World War. Wavel, yep, or Wavel, no. Good guess, not him. Well, according to this, it was the man whom Eisenhower considered an inadequate strategist, Bernard Law Montgomery. So I guess they don't consider Market Garden being his battle that he lost. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just a jackass reading the Old book. Name the two French ports that remained in German hands. I didn't know this. Until they surrendered at the end of the war. I did not know this. There were two French ports that remained in German hands until they surrendered at the end of the war. You get two, this is, a, this is worth two points, one for each one. I did not know that. All right, well, time to do the fleshy bits on this guy. on basing of the three calf for the PMR. What the hell? Post-Mongol Russian. Oh, okay. Toulouse? Nope. Not one of them. But honestly, I think a good guess. I think that's a good guess. But according to the book, it's wrong. <laughs> the damn book. The middle finger to the book's author. Le Havre? No. Marseille? No. 
Bordeaux, nope. I didn't know this. I've certainly heard of these two ports. I just didn't think that they would have been avoided. La Rochelle, also no. Another good guess. Because I know where La Rochelle is. It's down there in uh, the same area Toulouse is. I would not have thought that they would have avoided these two places. It actually makes no sense. Actually. Dunkirk, nope. Nope, you're going to run out of French port soon enough. They're both ports you guys have heard of. They're both ports that have submarine bases, U-boats. That's what they're known for, actually. If I name these two places, like, oh, yeah, that's where the freaking wolf packs come out of. Yep, nope. Nope. Well, you met Brest. No. Cherbourg. Also no. <laughs> His hard question in this book. I would, I would have missed it. I would have missed it because there's no way in my mind I would think that these two places, where they're located on the map, would have been avoided. You know? Danzig. Wrong country. No. Brest. Uh, also answered by someone. Also no. <laughs> These two ports are very close to each other, by the way. And I guess the Allies just avoided them. I don't know why they would have done such a thing, but... Um, it's a hard quiz, man. Who's in the lead? Is it Joe? Joe's in the lead with three. Dirk's got two. Kevin's got one. St. Nazaire. Greg, give Gregory a, a question. Give him, give him a point. Yep. Pomfret. Pomfret gets one. Saint Nazaire. That's one of them. What's the other one? It's also a subport. It's right next to Saint Nazaire. I don't know how the hell the Allies avoided Saint Nazaire. It makes no effing sense. Makes no effing sense. All right. Lorient, there it is. Another one for Nordic. Nordic's on the map. Nordic. Lorient. Yep. Lorient and Saint Nazaire. In contrast, Carentan was the first French town liberated by the Allies in July 12, 1944. Okay. That's nice. It's not a port. Which Allied general at one time advocated celibacy for those serious about pursuing a military career? Some Allied general says, hey, you want to be uh, successful? Make sure you're celibate. Who was it? Allied general. Didn't know this one. Not exactly. My area of study is not um, celibacy and, and winning wars. <laughs> Climbing up the ranks by being celibate. There you go, Montgomery. Did you know that? He just guessed. Uh, when Bernard Law Montgomery was a young officer, he held that belief. I guess maybe a lot of you didn't. I don't know. Nordic gets another one. Bam. 
Okay. Who is the only general to land with the first wave of troops on the beaches of Normandy? The only general to land with the first wave of troops on the beaches of Normandy. I'm going to give you a hint. He wasn't German. It makes sense because he was straight-edged. I really don't know much about him. Only general to land on the first wave of troops on the beaches of Normandy. Monty was no fun at parties, huh? Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Is it? Yep. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, 4th Division on Utah Beach. It's been the right answer two times in a row now. <laughs> yeah. What's that? One for Nordic? Nordic freaking woke up? Nordic's tied with Joe for three. tell you what it is too and we're going to skip this question this doesn't really count identify the ss division responsible for protecting hitler at the rostenberg headquarters so it's not what you think according to this book the gross deutschland division which is not an ss division it's uh it's an elite division like uh panzer ha throw this book out Who was, nah, that's not a good question. Some of these are just too freaking obscure and shit.
too freaking easy. Here's an interesting question. Talking about Dieppe raid, from which country did the Allied troops involved in the raid on Dieppe come? Canada. There were 3,600, no, 3,369 casualties out of just over 5,000 troops. So odds are you were going to die or be wounded. Which member of Hitler's, oh, a Hitler question. Here we go, it's the Hitler channel. Which member of Hitler's inner circle was born in Alexandria, Egypt? No clue. Somebody in Hitler's inner circle was born in Alexandria, Egypt. Who was it? Delay is going to ruin me. You must have been sleeping earlier. Which member of Hitler's inner circle? Don't be using no internet, I find out. I'm going to send the Gestapo after you. Well, we'll have to recruit the Gestapo first, then send them after you. We don't just have Gestapo on standby. <laughs> Gehring, no. Not Gehring. He would be considered in your circle, though, definitely. I, there's, there's no way I would have known this. It's somebody you've heard of. It's not going to be like, you know, the butler for freaking um, the interior minister of, you know, agriculture or some shit like that. Himmler, no. Montgomery, no. I'm German, so they won't come after me. Ha! They'll come after you first. Ribbentrop, good guess, no. Dennis, nope. Yodel, nope. <laughs> Eva Brown, <laughs> no. <laughs> what was the, what was, uh, what was the German shepherd name? What was Hitler's German shepherd name? Willie or whatever it was. Was it Willie? No. No, it was a human. <laughs> Someone that was born a human. Hess, there we go. Hess, one for Kevin. Kevin's up to two. There's no way I would have known that. I would just, honestly, I probably would have forgotten about Hess. You know? To be honest with you.
Irish defeat resulted in the greatest U.S. surrender in history? Which defeat resulted in the greatest U.S. surrender in history? Blondie. Okay, Blondie was the name of his damn dog. Yeah. He even wanted the dogs blonde-haired and blue-eyed. question what was it again which defeat resulted in the greatest US surrender in history Philippines Kevin gets it am I gonna go for bronze scales I'm not I'm I, I don't I kind of did like an in-between color almost like a scale it doesn't look like it would be bronze okay Kevin gets one Kevin Kevin's tied for with three points with Joe, who may or may not be on here, and uh, and Nordic. Identify the three countries occupied by U.S. Marines in the Atlantic. There's three countries that were occupied by the U.S. Marines in the Atlantic. What were they? I don't think I would have gotten a single one of them. I may have gotten one. Face, face, do them in the face. Hmm. We'll see if when we sign on tomorrow morning, I can change the response time to be a little quicker. I think what it does is it makes the video shittier, but you can get a quicker response time. I think that's what it is, and I may only be able to set that when I start the, the whole feed. So we'll try that tomorrow morning, see how that works out. Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Congratulations, you got none of them. Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, also none. Virgin Islands, not one of them. And apparently this happened on July 7th, 1941. And I'll give you a hint, it was done in order to free British troops for service elsewhere. It was done before neutrality ended to free up British troops for use elsewhere, also known as probably North Africa. Haiti, nope, 
No British troops in Haiti. They'll be worth one point each. What the hell? Azores, no. Greenland, no. Iceland, we have a winner. Nordic gets one point for Iceland. That's one of them. Jamaica, nope. Good guess. Am I allowed further guesses? Sure, why not? Belize, that's a great guess. Nope. All right, Gregory. British Virgin Islands, also a good guess. Nope. I would have probably guessed at this point Bermuda. And I would have had to tell myself, nope, that ain't it. So it's not Bermuda. I don't know how many troops could have been in these places. I'm thinking, man, you really got to have your back up against the wall to like pull all the troops from some of these places. I mean, how many troops could be there, you know? 50? I'll give you guys another minute. Actually, we'll have to we'll have to call it after this one. It's almost eleven o'clock at night, and my happy ass needs to be up at five. It doesn't need to be up at five. I choose to be up at five, like a sadist. Canary Islands, Falkland Islands, nope. Nigeria, nope. Nope. Nope, 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 no. Name every place that they ever set foot in in the Okay. Then it's up. On July 7th, 1941, five months before its neutrality was to abruptly end, the US government occupied Trinidad, Iceland, and British Guyana, also known as Guyana now, in order to free British troops for service elsewhere. I mean, how many, how many British troops could have been on freaking Trinidad? 20? You know. Crazy, crazy. All right. Isle of Hawaii. <laughs> okay, I didn't get much done, but I stayed awake. So, uh, Nordic by one point. Okay, well, we'll try it again tomorrow. If you guys enjoyed it, I don't know if you enjoyed it or not. Well, it kept me awake at least, but um, at least a thousand, huh? Well, that's quite a bit. Yeah, you could do something with a thousand troops. There's no doubt about it. Okay, folks. Well, we'll catch you guys next time. See you tomorrow morning. And, uh...